This morning I'm going to talk about something that's very relevant to Christmas. And this morning I would like to talk about Emmanuel. Emmanuel is the greatest gift of Christmas. And for most people, Christmas is a season of rushing around, spending money, panic, stress. And for some, it's even a season of sadness. But our society has really lost sight of the original message of Christmas. So let's have a look, first of all, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The whole story of Jesus is filled with normality. Mary wasn't from a noble family. She was just a normal, everyday teenager who honoured God. Jesus came cloaked in commonness. Mary and Joseph were a normal couple. On that first Christmas night, they walked along common roads. They carried dust from the road on them. They travelled to an insignificant town, dealing with a government requirement, facing the problem of the crowded, crowded hotels with no vacancies. There were mundane problems that probably any one of us could face. This normal couple were forced to take shelter in a common stable. There was no special dispensation, no special treatment, because the world's greatest gift came to a normal working couple struggling to find a place. And you know, with the retelling of the Christmas story over and over, we kind of, I, I don't know about you, but a lot of the stories you hear or, or you know, the nativity scenes that you see, it sort of portrays Mary and Joseph in an almost saint-like state. But the fact is that they weren't saints. And I can imagine, you know, that being a normal couple and Mary probably was not feeling the best. She was in early stages of labour. And, you know, she would have been hot and tired and exhausted. And I imagine that by the time they got to Bethlehem, she probably was feeling a bit irritated. I mean, she was a normal woman. She was actually a teenager. But that doesn't help either. But <laughs> here they were. They'd arrived in Bethlehem. There was no place to stay, and I would not be surprised if they started to have a bit of an argument. You know, Mary's probably blaming Joseph for the fact that, you know, he wasn't more organised, he hadn't arranged anything. Joseph probably shot back, well, you know, if you hadn't wanted to stop so many times along the way, you know, <laughs> they might have had a ding-dong fight. I know that almost seems sacrilege when you sing, you know, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, to think about Mary and Joseph having a big argument. But Jesus was born in a normal family. There was nothing saintly about the family that Jesus came into. And when we think about the village of Bethlehem, it wasn't a special town. He wasn't born in Jerusalem. He wasn't born in you know, one of the great cities of the world at that point, he just picked a normal, insignificant town to be born in. And the residents of that town were completely indifferent to what was happening in the town. Most of them would have been asleep, most of them 
would have been complete, none of them would have even known the significant event that was taking place that night. An event so significant that it would change the whole course of humanity. An event, there's never been a more momentous event than what happened on that night. See, Jesus chose common settings and a normal family so that we could believe that he is Emmanuel, that he would do this again and again and be with us in our commonness. Emmanuel was not a gift to an exclusive group of people. He didn't come to live a life of privilege. His entrance to the world was a miracle beyond what any rabbi would have dreamt or what any prophet would have foresaw. The one who was in the beginning, the one who everything through whom everything was created, clothed himself in human form and became one of us and dwelt among us. Emmanuel in, human, in Hebrew means with us and El is a name ascribed to God. So Emmanuel means the with us God. His decision to be born in the normal manner is like an artist who paints a beautiful canvas and makes himself a dot, a dot of paint on that canvas. The creator became a fetus in the womb of a young girl, making it possible for us to believe that God is with us even now. There's no reason for you to think that you're too insignificant for God to dwell with you. There's no reason to believe that you can only experience God's presence in church. Now Mary and Joseph didn't have the scientific advances that we have today, but if, if they did, I imagine that Mary would have made an appointment to the local ultrasound clinic. And they would have been there and they would have watched as, as pictures of Jesus, baby Jesus, came up on the screen and the doctor or technician would have been explaining, oh, that's his heart beating, and there's the limbs moving, and yep, seems to have five fingers, five toes. And I can even imagine Joseph taking a long, hard look just to check that it really was a boy. Because <laughs> who wants to call their daughter Jesus, right? <laughs> And at the conclusion, there would have been the usual announcement, which is, everything's normal. That's the, what, what parents always want to hear, isn't it? Everything looks normal. And Jesus was a normal baby, by all accounts. But he was no normal child. His name would be Emmanuel. And this baby that was wrapped in normalness and looked like a normal baby was no less than God. He made his entrance into the world in normal circumstances, a normal birth, the with us God. Do you ever stop to think how much God really, really loves you? That he would leave his world and come into yours so that you could go into his. Can you imagine what it would have been like for Jesus to leave heaven? We uh, went to Mosaic last night and one of the scenes was Jesus leaving heaven. And it would have been a really sombre occasion, I imagine. Here he was leaving for 33 years. We're talking about the creator of the world. That he, had, he was bound by nothing, not bound by time, not bound by space. He could be anywhere in the universe he wanted. And here he was, coming down to earth as a vulnerable baby. And during his life, he limited himself to as far as his feet could take him. He was limited by time, limited by space, limited by what he could achieve in that small area in which he placed himself. And I imagine that... Well, I know that he would have felt every emotion that we feel. He felt hunger, he felt tiredness, he felt physical pain, he would have felt emotional pain, he faced temptation, he faced rejection, he faced loneliness. Why? So that we would know him as a man would. God is with you. With you in your sickness, he's with you in your fear, he's with you in your joyous moments. He's with you in your daily frustrations. Bethlehem shows us that he comes without pomp and ceremony, 
and he's present in our ordinary moments. The theme of the Old Testament is the presence of God with Israel. It was a mark of their separation from all other nations of the earth. We see this in Exodus 33, verse 15 and 16. Moses is speaking to God and he says, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people, unless you go with us? What will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? You see, God's presence was the thing that made the difference. God's presence was a sign that God was pleased with them. God's presence gave them victory, and God's presence helped them to enter their promised land. But the New Testament takes us even further by telling us that not only is God with us, but that God comes and makes his home within us, within those who love him. God with us and God in us. And it all began with the Christmas story. Let's read Luke's version in chapter 1. In verse 28. Now this is the angel speaking to Mary. And the angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You've found favour with God. You will be with child and you will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born and will be called the Son of God. I wonder what it would have been like for Mary to have Jesus the Lord of all creation growing inside her, developing in her body and growing to the point of delivery. The anticipation she must have felt when she started to begin to feel that initial evidence of his life within her. What is it like to feel Jesus growing inside of you? Growing to the point where he has to come out. What is it like to deliver Jesus to the world? from the flow of his spirit within you. One of the great Christmas gifts that God gives to you is a supernatural deposit of his spirit within you. Revelations 3.20 describes how Jesus knocks on the door of our heart and waits for us to invite him in. And then he comes in and fellowships with us. And when you open the door to Christ to come in, you become like a modern day Mary. And the world around you is like a modern day Bethlehem, where you deliver Jesus to a needy world. The Christmas story reveals that not only does God live with us, but God lives in us. Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 is that God may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The mystery of the gospel is Emmanuel God with us and in us. He longs to be in you. He will occupy the interior of your soul until he grows and grows until he has to come out. Just as there's a certain point in pregnancy where the baby has to be delivered, when we nurture the spirit in our lives, there comes a point where love is no longer forced, where his life just comes out of us naturally. Just as Jesus ministered to his disciples, the Holy Spirit ministers to each one of us as believers. Because Jesus said it was to his benefit that he goes away so the Holy Spirit could come and be in us. See, the Holy Spirit is Emmanuel, a year-round resident in the hearts of all believers. And as God's story becomes our story, God's power becomes our power. As we walk in the Spirit and fellowship with Him, His Spirit occupies us to such an extent that His presence becomes a gift to other people. The delivery of Jesus to the world comes from nurturing 
our fellowship with him and honouring the high privilege of his presence in our life. But sadly, that delivery does not always arrive because the life inside of us does not always come to full term. I had, many years ago, I had a client and she was about 60 and she used to get these debilitating migraines probably about twice a week and they would last for about 24 hours and they were so debilitating, she'd lose her vision, she'd be in extreme pain, she had numbness in her body and she just had to lie down and, and wait it out. And this meant she hadn't been able to sustain any employment for years and years and um, she tried all these things. She'd been, you know, every doctor she'd go to, oh yes, I know, I can, I can fix it and would take her through all these different medications, different therapies. She was, um, she participated in lots of drug trials. She was really um, just desperate to get this out of her life. And during a session with her after she'd been coming for about a year, she opened up about the darkest day of her life. And it was when she was forced to drive away from the hospital, leaving her dead baby behind. So she had um, carried this baby into late pregnancy and then noticed that there were, she wasn't experiencing any movement. So she went to the hospital and delivered this baby and it had died and it died of starvation because apparently there was a problem with the placenta so it had, it, the baby was healthy looked normal but it just hadn't got the nutrition that it needed in those late stages of pregnancy and this was in the days that, so we're talking you know 30, probably 40 years ago um, there was no support, there was no counselling. She delivered this child and then was just sent home and leaving this dead baby behind. And she just carried such a weight of guilt and shame about that and just believed it was her fault because she had starved her child. And just imagine carrying that burden for so many years and never talking about it. And um, it's quite possible that that burden had contributed to her illness. And of course, my client wasn't responsible for that her starvation of her child, but how often does the life of the spirit is not nurtured within us? It fails to grow because it becomes starved of life. And we never reach the point where we deliver his life to the world. Why? Because we fail to look after that life-giving connection between us. We fail to appreciate and prioritise the greatest gift we've been given, Emmanuel, God with us and in us. Have you been really excited about a present you've bought? You've bought it for someone and you think it's just what they, they like and you're really excited about it and you can't wait for them to open it and they open it up and it just doesn't play out like you thought it would. <laughs> yeah. uh, and maybe, maybe they are excited. Maybe they show some excitement about when they open it. But over time you notice that they haven't used it. It's kind of lies neglected on a shelf. Well, the gift of God's presence to us is like that present. It has cost God so much to make his presence available to us. And we often we'll receive it with anticipation and excitement, but then it's like we put it on the shelf and we neglect it. God's presence in our life, like Jesus in the womb of Mary, requires nurture for delivery. It requires us to continually connect with him and to honour his presence above all else. There's many examples in scripture that teach us the value of God's presence and what can happen when we fail to appreciate his, his privilege. But just let's consider the prodigal son and his brother. Now both of them are sons of the father, they're part of his family, so we could call them believers in our terms. They're in the kingdom, they're part of God's family, they're recipients of salvation who've come into God's inheritance. They have a father who's provided them with all they need, but more importantly, he's a loving father. 
He wants nothing more than to spend time with his sons and to love on them. Now the younger son's response is, life in the presence of my father is too constricting. I need to get out of here and go on a journey of self-discovery. I'll take whatever I'm owed. And isn't it funny, when we draw away from God and distance ourselves from him, we lose perspective. We forget that we owe him everything. And even life itself, when we start to live with this sense of entitlement. So the younger son was like this, he said, right, I'm going to take what I'm owed and I'm going to go on a quest to find and fulfil myself. Even if a few people get hurt along the way. I need to find myself away from my father's presence. He thought that by separating himself from his father, he would find his true identity. But we all know how that journey turned out. Back in his father's arms. Because the only way to find your true identity is to stay in your father's presence. But first and foremost, you are his child. Then we meet the older brother. Now, while his, his sibling's decision to disconnect from the father was more overt, the older brother harbours a wrong attitude to the father's presence. The father has to remind him, my son, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. You see, the older brother worked hard. He was on a program of self-salvation. He was seeking the approval of his community and he was trying to earn something that he already had, which was his father's approval. Why was the older brother working so hard? Well, he was focused on the day when he would come into his full inheritance, which was the day his father died. The day his father would no longer be with him. He thought that, that was the day that he would receive everything. Everything but his father's presence. Just like his younger brother, he saw the father's presence as an obstacle to achieving everything he dreamt about. You know, he could have asked the father for anything and the father would have given it to him while he was still alive. But instead, he saw the father as stingy. He said, you haven't even given me a goat so that I can have a party with his friends. Why did he have that perspective? Because he didn't know the father's heart. He didn't spend time in the Father's presence. If he had, he would have seen the extravagant, loving Father that he was, that he demonstrated towards his brother. If you really want to get to know God, if you want a real clear picture of who he is, you need to spend time in his presence. Your misconceptions of God are because you've distanced yourself. See, God is not a Father to be feared. He's your safe place. He's not against you, he's for you. And he enjoys nothing more than revealing himself to you. <clears throat> we don't have to wait for death to occur to enjoy God's presence. We can live in his presence every day, here and now. This Christmas, let us acknowledge and celebrate the greatest gift of all, Emmanuel. I challenge you to deliver the nature of Christ from within you to those around you, so that God is not only with you and in you, but he's also expressed through you. God's desire is that you deliver to the world his loving, extravagant nature. Give an extravagant gift to someone this Christmas. It doesn't have to cost you money. It could be the gift of kindness. It could be the gift of hospitality to someone who's lonely. It could be the gift of forgiveness to someone that you might be estranged from. An extravagant gift comes in many forms. Encouragement, love. There are so many gifts that we can give to people that have the potential to change their lives. Give a gift that will always be remembered by someone. Let Emmanuel touch and change the world around you. I'd like to extend an invitation as we draw the close to anyone who may not have made that initial step of inviting Jesus into their life. 
Maybe you're like the innkeeper on that first Christmas and you think, I don't have any room for God. But when God comes in, he expands the world. And you begin to have room for not only God, but for other people. The message of Christmas is that Jesus entered the world. But it's incomplete without the message of Easter. Because just as Jesus was born a baby, he was born a baby in order to become the man that died for you. And if you're willing to hand over control and discover Emmanuel, you'll discover that he's everything you've been searching for.